Over the past few weeks, we have seen how bad things were in Israel. Things were terrible in the time of the judges. But in all fairness, I want to point out that things were not always as bad as they could have been. As bad as things were, there were still some good things in that world that were worth fighting for. And this is a reminder to us that God's grace is always working in the world, always at work in ways that are not easily seen or noticed by us. Towards the end of the time of the judges, a non-Jewish woman and her Jewish mother-in-law moved to Bethlehem. Tragically, both women had become widows. Their husbands died and left them in dire straits, and there they were, teetering on the edge of abject poverty and destitution. All they had in the world was each other, a small plot of land, a little bit of hope, a whole lot of courage, and the Lord. That's all they had in the world. And so they moved to Bethlehem to be closer to family and friends, to be closer to familiar people and places. To use a football expression, this move was their Hail Mary pass, a desperation play, their last chance for survival. When they arrived in Bethlehem, it was harvest time. The younger younger woman went to work on the edges of the fields, gathering up leftover barley, gleaning like a poor sojourner. One day, she caught the eye of a barley grower. And he insisted that she glean from his fields and drink from his wells. And he promised her that he would keep her safe, that none of his men would bother her. He was not a good-looking man, but he was a godly man. And in the time of the judges, he stood out like a light shining in a dark place. The mother-in-law knew the culture and the customs of Bethlehem quite well, so she hatched a plot. She convinced her daughter-in-law to bathe and to beautify herself and then to bravely present herself to the barley grower and to present herself to him as a wife, to offer her hand in marriage. The young widow agreed to do all of that. So one night during the harvest festivities, the young woman snuck into the place where the barley grower was sleeping And she slipped onto the edge of his bed, and in the middle of the night, she startled him awake. And risking even more scandal, she said, spread your wings over me, for you are a redeemer. Help me, Boaz, you're our only hope. And Boaz understood her signals and took Ruth as his wife. The scripture says he went into her and the Lord gave her conception and she bore a son. This story takes place at a time when the God-given created order was still accepted as the norm and treated with respect among God's people. At a time when a man was a man and a woman was a woman, when sex was celebrated in marriage between a husband and a wife, And where children were welcomed into the world as a blessing and not viewed as an inconvenience, an accident, or a mistake. Boaz and Ruth came together as husband and wife and made a baby. The two became one flesh. They were fruitful and multiplied. And this ordinary event that could so easily be overlooked matters far more than it might appear at this moment. For the scripture goes on to say that Boaz fathered Obed, Obed fathered Jesse, and Jesse fathered David. All this took place in Bethlehem, the house of bread, which shall be renamed the city of David. And that brings us to our story in 1 Samuel 16. As you know... The Lord had rejected Saul as king, just like Israel had rejected God as king. Saul's half-hearted obedience had moved the Lord to regret ever making him as king. So the Lord sent Samuel to Bethlehem, to a different tribe, to anoint a new king, 
a true and better king. To be fair, we need to know that it was not Israel's request for a king that offended the Lord. The Lord always intended to give Israel a king. He wanted to give Israel a king. It was a part of his secret plan. And we know this because the scriptures tell us and give us clues about God's plan. For example, before there was ever a king in Israel, there was a specific law for kings in the book of Deuteronomy. It says, You may indeed set a king over you whom the Lord your God will choose, one from among your brothers you shall set as king over you. And when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself in a book a copy of this law approved by the Levitical priest, and it shall be with him, and he shall read in it all the days of his life that he may learn to fear the Lord his God by keeping all the words of this law and doing them. God intended for Israel to have a king made in the image and likeness of God, a king that would write and read and obey God's law. We also know that God wanted Israel to have a king because of Hannah's song. Hannah was Samuel, the prophet's mother. When Samuel was a little boy, she lent him to the Lord and left him with a priest to be raised up in the house of God. And then she praised God for his many blessings upon her life, including the king of Israel. She sang, the Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Keep in mind that Hannah offered this prayer at a time when there were no kings in Israel and everyone was doing what seemed right in their own eyes. This was during the time of the judges. So years later, after Hannah has passed away and her little boy has become a grown man and now he is an old man, the Lord sends her son on a mission to anoint a new king over Israel perhaps an answer to her prayer. It's not a king made in the image and likeness of Israel, but a king made in the image and likeness of God. A man after God's own heart, not a man that follows his own heart and goes his own way. Now this mission that God has given Samuel seems like mission impossible. But the Lord reassures Samuel that he will make him know which man to anoint as king. It seems like mission impossible because how is Samuel supposed to know what is in the heart of any man when only God can do that? The Lord has already perceived and discerned the man. The scriptures say, literally, I have seen from Jesse's sons a king for me. But the mission makes Samuel nervous. And the reason it makes Samuel nervous is because, if you recall from last week, we learned that Samuel had already told King Saul that God rejected him as king and tore the kingdom from his hand and gave it to a better man. So you know that that Saul is feeling paranoid and fearful and he wants to do everything to protect his life and his throne. Samuel knows that Saul is keeping his eyes and ears wide open to spy out any rivals that he might have to face and fight. Because like any king, he wants to protect what is his. He wants to hang on to his crown at all costs. So this mission puts Samuel's life at risk. But notice what the Lord does to protect Samuel. The Lord comes up with a plan. A plan called holy deception. Holy deception. Holy deception is not a way of lying and getting away with it. It is a way of telling the truth by concealing some of the facts and letting people assume what they want about the rest. That is holy deception. So Samuel goes along with this, and he does what the Lord commands, and he comes to Bethlehem. When he comes to Bethlehem, the elders of the city see him and they react with fear. Why? Well, some people say, well, they reacted with fear because of guilt and shame. They're afraid he's coming to do what prophets do and lay into them and let them have it. It's actually worse than that in the context, because if you remember, the last thing we learned about Samuel from last week is that 
Samuel had done a crazy thing, at least crazy in our eyes. It would look like this. How would you feel if news reached you that one of your pastors at RPC had confronted and dressed down the most powerful man in the land and lived to tell about it? And how would you feel if that same pastor had also taken on one of the most wicked mob bosses in the country and cut him to pieces with a sword? And now he's coming to visit you. This is why the elders of the city are terrified. Just like you might feel a little bit nervous and squeamish and weirded out, they're afraid. This is the story that's playing out with Samuel in Bethlehem because he did to the Amalekite king what Saul refused to do. Saul paraded that king around like a trophy, but when Samuel came, he dispatched him like the enemy he was. So when you think of Samuel, don't think of some weak and frail old man barely making his way around the land. You know, Samuel is an old codger, but he is an old school man of God and not afraid to fight. So when the elders see him, they're in terror. And they ask this question, do you come in shalom? Do you come in peace? And he says, I've come to slaughter. Peace. Cryptic answer. He doesn't tell the elders everything he's planning to do. He only answers the questions that are asked. Good rule of thumb, by the way. He does not share all the reasons for his visit. And here's why. Because if Saul finds out the real reason for his visit, Saul will likely kill Samuel and David and the elders and David's brothers and perhaps even his father Jesse. I've come to slaughter peace. There's a play on words in the Hebrew text. The Hebrew word for slaughter and sacrifice are the same word. Samuel arrives in Bethlehem and he has a cow in tow, a heifer, a female bovine. And this is a signal to everyone that Samuel is there not to slaughter any people, but he's there to slaughter a sacrifice, a heifer on behalf of the people. And this is good news. This is actually good news because a sacrificed heifer means that God is going to cleanse his people and purify the sins of his people, cover over them, just as he promised to do when Abram cut a heifer in half and the Lord God passed through that blood trail, making a covenant with him. But rather than include the whole city in the sacrifice or even inviting the elders, Jesse and his family are set apart. They're singled out. And the scripture says that Samuel helped them get ready for church. That's what it means that he consecrated them. He, get, he helped them get ready for church. And this is about more than helping them put on their Sunday church clothes. It's that, but it's a whole lot more than that. It's also about getting them ready, body and soul, to draw near to God in worship. I don't want to dwell on this point right now today, but I want to say this. That once upon a time, consecrating yourself body and soul for worship was a thing. It was a standard practice among God's people. It used to be that Christians were more deliberate and intentional about preparing themselves to meet with God and to come to his table on the Lord's Day. It wasn't something they just sort of fit into their schedule and that they were frantic about. It shaped the way they scheduled their life and how they dressed and how they planned for lunch and how they spent the Lord's Day. I would love to see us recover that ancient tradition of consecrating ourselves for the Lord's Day. I think it's safe to say that our more casual and cavalier trends have not helped us become more spiritually mature. They've actually stunted our spiritual growth and formation. But more on that another time. I just want to stick a thorn in your side today that so you, you have something to poke around with and prod you later on. Samuel consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to a sacrifice. 
And the reason he sets them apart for participation in God's holy things is because this service was not open to everyone. It was open to them. It's by invitation only. This is the only way Samuel can go through with this holy deception. That he can accomplish his mission and anoint the new king and still keep it secret and keep it safe. Now, this act alone should have made the elders of the city very nervous, at least suspicious that something strange was going on. But I think that they were just happy that Samuel was not there to mess with them and bug them, so they let it go. When Jesse and his sons came, sons came before Samuel, he looked at all those strong men and he thought, this is it. I've got the pick of the litter here. I mean, we're going to get a king today. Surely one of these strong, strapping young men is going to be the Lord's anointed. But the Lord says to Samuel, hey, hey, keep your eye on the ball. We're not looking for Saul 2.0. We've been there. We've done that. That's not what we're doing today. Don't look at people through your eyes. Look at them through my eyes. For the Lord sees not as a man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. As far back as I can remember, going back to youth group days when I was a teenager, I've heard well-meaning ministers use this story, this passage, to justify all kinds of sinful and silly things. And you've probably heard this sort of thing as well. It doesn't matter how you sing, what you wear, what you look like, how you give, because God looks at your heart. That's all that matters. If you feel the need to swim against the the tide or cut against the grain or go your own way, do your own thing, it's okay. God knows that you're just trying to be true to yourself. Blaze your own trail. Follow your own heart. You've been influenced by Disney. He gets it. It's okay. Outward image doesn't matter to God. What matters to God are your inward motives and your intentions. And I cannot express loudly and clearly enough how terribly wrong all of that is. God cares about your body and your soul. He cares about your inside and your outside, your intentions and your actions. The truth is, That the Lord sees not only as a man sees, he sees all of that, but the Lord also looks on the heart and sees what man cannot see. The Lord sees each and every one of you, inside and out. He knows each and every one of us better than the FBI, Google algorithms, and Life360. They've got nothing on the Holy Spirit who searches all things even the intentions and the imaginations of our hearts. God cares about you inside and out. We live in a sacramental world. That means the outward things, the outward things you do with your body are generally signs of inward truths about your heart, mind, and soul. What you are on the outside is a reflection of who you are on the inside. Samuel put it this way to Saul. What good, is it, what good is it to you if God looks on your heart and sees stubbornness and rebellion? Listening to God's word and obeying his voice is much better than making sacrifices to clean up your mess and cover your tracks. Staying out of the mud is much better than scrubbing the mud out of your clothes because you refuse to stay out of the mud. God cares about your body and your soul. He cares about your inside and your outside and So should you. When Jesse made seven sons pass before Samuel, Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord hasn't chosen any of these. These guys just won't do. Then Samuel realized something wasn't quite right, and so he asked Jesse, are all your sons here? If there was ever a reason to tremble with fear because Samuel was in Bethlehem, this was it. Jesse has disobeyed the prophet of God. He didn't bring all of his sons. And then he starts doing what his father has done. And what we all do is we make mistakes. When we make mistakes, we start trying to cover our tracks and make excuses. He says, well, yeah, I mean, there's this other one, but he's taking care of the sheep. I mean, he's young. And you know why he does this? He does this because, sadly, sometimes even dads 
look on the outward appearance of their sons and daughters and not on the heart. He misjudged his son. He figured his youngest son was the least important and the most insignificant of his sons. He had better things to do like take care of sheep. He couldn't come to an important meeting with the prophet of God and see what God's purpose for their family might be. He had to go work. But the least of these was important to the Lord, and so Samuel calls for him. Samuel calls for him, and David comes to meet him. And I want you to see something in this story that just a few minutes ago we heard the Lord tell Samuel, don't look on his appearance, don't look on his height, pay no attention to all of that. And as soon as David comes walking up, what does the Holy Spirit tell us about David? Tells us about his appearance, tells us about his height. The Spirit describes David's, in a, David's appearance and height in this way. He was ruddy, he had beautiful eyes, and he was handsome. Isn't this the kind of thing we heard about Saul? Isn't this what we were supposed to overlook with the other sons of Jesse? What's going on here? What's highlighted are both the similarities and the differences between Saul and David. Like Saul, David was young and handsome, and yet he's different from Saul in other ways. He was ruddy. It means he was like Esau. Red hair, red skin. Maybe he was reddish like the heifer that was sacrificed. He had beautiful eyes. Like Sarah and Rachel, he was pleasant to behold. And his eyes must have been striking because the Hebrew word used to describe his eyes, the word beautiful used here, is rarely ever used to describe men. It's often used to describe women and trees and cattle and music, but not men. His eyes must have been beautiful. But this shepherd boy didn't look a thing like a king to anyone except the Lord God. And so to everyone's surprise... The Lord says to Samuel, Arise, anoint him. He is the chosen one. The Lord sees not as man sees. The Lord looks on the heart and sees what man cannot see. And he saw in David a man after his own heart. In case you've forgotten, the story of the Bible often prefers the younger brother over older brothers. If you're an older brother, that probably bothers you more than it should. That's just your pride speaking. But why does the Lord prefer the younger over the older? As you get to know the Lord, you realize that he prefers grace over nature. He prefers mercy over sacrifice. His ways are not our ways. So Samuel anoints David with oil, a sign of the outpouring of the Spirit on David and a seal of the Spirit's presence and power in David's life. Psalm 78 summarizes the story of David in this way when it says, God chose David his servant and took him from the sheepfolds, from following the nursing ewes. He brought him to shepherd Jacob, his people, Israel, his inheritance. With upright heart, he shepherded them and guided them with his skillful hand. As you know by experience, no sermon is a gospel sermon unless it proclaims the good news of Jesus Christ, which we have not yet done. On the road to Emmaus, Jesus told his followers that all the law, the prophets, and the Psalms testify about him. How the scriptures do that is a deep and profound mystery. Sometimes as we're reading the scriptures, we wonder, where is Jesus in the Old Testament? How do I focus the eyes of my heart so that I can see Christ in all of the scriptures? We know he's there hiding in plain sight, but we often struggle to see him in the story we're reading. And I want to encourage you by saying this is not a matter of IQ. It's not a matter of higher theological degrees. There is no secret decoder ring or hermeneutical formula or foolproof method for discovering Christ in all of the scriptures. Seeing Christ in all the scriptures is a gracious and glorious work of the Holy Spirit in you. And so if you want to see what this or that story has to do with Jesus, 
If you want to see Christ in all of the scriptures, there are two things you must do. The first is you must pray and ask for illumination. Second, you must pay attention to the scriptures as to a lamp shining in a dark place. And you must keep doing that until the day dawns and the morning star rises up in your hearts. With that in mind, let me remind you that we have prayed and asked God's Spirit to illumine our hearts that we might grasp the mystery of the gospel even in this story. So with the Spirit's help, let us focus the eyes of our hearts on this story once again and see what this story has to say about the Lord Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters and all of you who fear God, Listen, listen, we bring you the good news, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. This story shows and tells us that Jesus is the true kinsman redeemer who spreads his wings over you, who shelters you from the world, the flesh and the devil, who sacrificed himself to give you rest from your labors, who satisfies your heart with hope, love and mercy. Jesus is the true red heifer who gave up his life and shed his blood to purify our conscience from dead works so that we might serve and worship the true and living God. Jesus is the true Savior of the world, the Christ who was born of the Virgin Mary in the city of David who was praised by the angels of heaven when they sang glory to God in the highest and peace on earth. Jesus is the true son of God whose beautiful eyes shine like blazing fire, whose precious lips are full of grace and truth. Jesus is the true shepherd and bishop of our souls who bore our sins in his body on the tree who heals our wounds, who anoints our heads with oil, who prepares a table for us, who restores our souls, who gathers us together and guides us all the way home. Jesus is the true David, the chosen son, who was anointed king of glory by the Holy Spirit, who is crowned with glory and honor and who proclaims God's praises in the midst of the congregation of his brothers. Jesus is the true bread who came down from heaven to the house of bread for the life of the world. Whoever feeds on his flesh and drinks his blood has eternal life and he will raise that person up on the last day. Therefore, let it be known to you that through this man, Jesus... The forgiveness of sins, your sins, all of your sins, whatever they might be, even that one. The forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you and by Jesus, everyone who believes is set free from the curse of sin and death and from the captivity of the devil. I want you to know with full assurance that on this day, the message of this salvation has been sent to you. What will you do with it? What will you do with it? I encourage you to take heed. Because as the Spirit says, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For how shall we escape judgment and condemnation? If we neglect such a great salvation. So I urge you with all your heart. Repent. And believe the good news. Turn and trust the gospel of God's grace. Which is freely offered to you. In the Lord Jesus Christ. As it is written in the prophets. Everyone who puts their trust in him. In this king. Shall dwell secure. For he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be their peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, let us pray.